Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, preparing for your polar bear adventure, presented by NatHab Expedition Leader, Eleanor Eddy. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you for being here with us today. Over to you, Eleanor. Thank you, Rob, and welcome everybody. We're all so happy to see so many of you here, and I hope to be able to preemptively answer many of your questions. But as Rob said, we will have time at the end of the webinar for a Q&A session. So please do throw any questions or clarification that you might need into that, that questions panel and we'll get to it at the end of our webinar. So I'm here. I'm so excited for polar bear season. I hope you are as well and thrilled to share some details of the season with you all. Like Rob said, my name is Eleanor and I work both as an expedition leader in our Canadian programs as well as in operations during our polar bear season. So I've seen our bear season from both ends of things and probably many of you who have signed up today to watch this webinar will see me in Winnipeg when you arrive for your trip this year. Um, I work a lot of our Churchill seasons. I've recently wrapped up um, our Churchill summer season. We had lots of great bear sightings in the summer from boats when we were out looking at beluga whales. And we're also excited to see what the fall brings for our bear viewing as well. Just wanted to kick us off with kind of some thoughts I've always got on why polar bear season is so exciting for all of us here at the office. We all feel it to be a really meaningful time of year for all of us and a time for us to gather together as travelers and lovers of nature during this really special time of year when the ice is forming in Hudson Bay and the polar bears are waiting for it just like we are. So let's take a look at where in the world we're going to be going on this adventure. Um, here is a map of Canada and your trip, no matter which itinerary that you are on, you are going to start your trip in Winnipeg, your arrival location. So that bottom yellow arrow there, pardon me there uh, for the fox that briefly popped up, <laughs> the bottom yellow arrow is where Winnipeg is located. It's in roughly the, the longitudinal center of Canada in the southern end in the province of Manitoba. And after your welcome dinner and greeting and getting your gear in Winnipeg, we transfer north the following day to Churchill. Now, no matter whether you're in Winnipeg or Churchill, you're going to experience all our full NatHab service the whole way. And throughout your trip, you'll be accompanied by an expedition leader um, like me or like one of the many other ones out there and supported the entire way by your expedition leader and by our whole team. Uh, just to set the tone a little bit, Churchill at this time of year is known for polar bears as well as for other wildlife viewing as well as incredible scenery. And our, on our adventures, we always encourage you to take all those opportunities you might have, whether you were in the town of Churchill or outside exploring, um, to do all the viewing you possibly can. Churchill is a fairly small community. It's very remote. It's a town of around 800 year-round residents. And on our trips, whether you're on the, the uh, Tundra Lodge trip or in town, you're gonna get an incredible immersion into the, the larger habitat. And on our town-specific trips, you're gonna get an immersion into town as well. Um, so we'll introduce you to some amazing individuals in Churchill and some great things to do. And while Many of us, including me, you know, we all think that it's the wildlife that makes an adventure special and we can't deny that. But a lot of the time, the things that people remember are those that we meet along the way, like the people who call Churchill home. When you're on the tundra, there's really nothing between you and the wilderness except perhaps a window that you open or close. And whether you're staying in town or on our lodge, every moment is a potential wildlife experience. So to kick off our journey, journey, I'm gonna take you through the very beginning from your arrival in Winnipeg through to what's gonna happen in Churchill and some of the information that you need to know about all of this. So let's start off in Winnipeg. So while I'm sure some of you will be driving into Winnipeg, I also know that the majority of people do fly into Winnipeg and arrive at the Winnipeg International Airport. Now, when you arrive in Canada by flights, 
Um, if you've come in in the past few years, you might remember that we had some special COVID paperwork and things like that that you had to do crossing in. Um, but if you are arriving in Canada these days from the US or other countries, there is no longer any special paperwork besides your regular customs and immigration at the border. Um, and nor is any masking required on planes, though I do want to let you know that while you're on planes, especially within Canada, you always are going to see people wearing masks here and there, um, just to reduce the risk of getting ill while traveling, and you are certainly free to do so as well, um, and to continue mask wearing on your trip. Uh, I mention this because you're going to see it on the planes, and you'll see it in some of the images coming up as well, uh, of people who just chose to continue wearing masks throughout the trip. So when you arrive in Winnipeg at the airport, you are going to be met by one of our NatHab staff and transferred to our hotel in Winnipeg. You are going to look for the person wearing NatHab gear that will have a logo kind of like what I've got on me and what you can see on the screen there saying Natural Habitat Adventurous. And um, they are going to meet you right in the baggage collection area. So Winnipeg's not a big airport, okay? We have three whole baggage carousels and you can see them all in the, the picture right here. If you're arriving domestically, you'll arrive on that top level that you can see and come down the escalators on your left hand side, collect your baggage at one of those carousels and our staffer will be right in that area looking for you and you can look for them as well. Now, if you've come in on an international arrival, many times this is coming in through Minneapolis, but it may be through, there are some direct LA flights and a few other direct US flights as well, in which case they're gonna meet you in the exact same area, but you're gonna come in um, through the international arrivals. So when you arrive internationally, you go through customs and immigration right in Winnipeg, and you pop out, if you look at the carousels there, one, two, three, behind carousel number three, there's a glass wall, and that's where our customs and immigration is. So after that's all done, and you've gotten your bags from the baggage carousel back there, you go through those glass doors and into the regular domestic arrivals, and that's still where our people are going to be to pick you up. Now, um, if you are arriving early in Winnipeg, you've chosen to spend some extra time at the hotel, for example, if you have booked your hotels through us, um, or even if you've self-booked at the Hotel Fort Gary, which is our hotel, we will be keeping track of your arrivals and we will pick you up at the airport. If you've chosen to arrive in Winnipeg early and you're going to a different hotel that you self-booked, you'll have to make your own way to the Hotel Fort Gary on the first night uh, of your of your trip. Okay. So once you're out of the airport, you've collected your luggage, you've met your driver, you are going to be transferred on one of our vehicles to the Hotel Fort Gary. It's about a 20 minute ride. And coming up on this next slide here is what the Hotel Fort Gary looks like from the outside. It's a beautiful old railway hotel, lots of rooms, lots of banquet spaces, a really beautiful hotel and very centrally located. So we'll make sure you're all checked in. You'll be given a welcome letter with details on where to meet your guide for the welcome dinner, as well as where to meet with NatHav staff to get your loaner gear for your trip. So they will have hours and where to go to pick up your boots and parkas for your adventure. Now, if you're coming into the area early, uh, like many people choose to do, there are lots of things to do right in the area of the Hotel Fort Gary, though we do also offer an extra day program itinerary that does a whole day's worth of activities for somebody who wants to plan for that extra time and extra activities in Winnipeg. But let's talk about that loaner gear and what those boots and parkas are going to look like, because for all of our departures in bear season, which is October and November, we provide a rental, not rental, a, a loaner, because um, it is included in the, trip, uh, the cost of your departure, a loaner parka, like uh, this lovely blue one that this man's wearing, as well as loaner winter boots. So those, those boots are available in sizes from a women's size six up to a men's size 15. And depending on the, the size of your foot and how wide and all those things about it, we may put you in one style versus the other. And um, we do have that very large variety of sizes. Uh, we do have also a small selection of children's boots in, um, in children's sizes as well, but we're best stocked for our adult sizing. And the jackets are available in sizes extra small to 5X. So lots of size ranges 
for those boots and parkas. Now, all of those boots and parkas, um, there's very little variation with them within them except for the, the sizes. So our guides and our staff in Winnipeg are very, very well practiced at finding you the right option of gear for your trip. Now, regardless of what itinerary you're on, we're not taking you out on 10 mile marches every day. They just need to be warm and comfortable for wearing um, during our activities and to keep you safe when you're on the ground. So that's what you're going to be receiving from us and we'll make sure that you're well kitted out before your trip starts. But I wanna go over what other things that you will want to bring with you on your trip. Um, and this will mostly include warm layers that I'll go through right away, um, mitts or gloves, a warm hat, comfortable socks, Depending what time you're traveling with us, whether you're coming, for example, in early October versus late November, there can be some very significant differences in temperatures. And of course, we're all individuals and some of us are warmer and some of us are colder. So if you tend to run cold, by all means, bring several layers um, like the types I'll go through right away, um, knowing that we're going to have these jackets for you as well. Some people do choose if they're traveling from a cold area or have cold weather gear of their own. You can choose to bring your own gear. That's certainly fine to do so. What we'd ask you to do in that case is just bring your gear down for your expedition leader to look at and make sure that it's adequate for the conditions on your trip. But otherwise, if you're most comfortable with your own gear, you're certainly free to use that. Um, we like ours, we know that it works, um, but you're free to use your own if you like. Now I'll throw up a slide right away with some, with some example layers, like what we would suggest that you pack. But I will also point out to you that all of the slides coming up, um, with one or two obvious exceptions, were taken during different bear seasons. So you'll see some of the different ground conditions, the different weather conditions, and the different clothing that people have found useful during these times. So again, lots of variation depending what the weather is going to be like on your exact trip. Oh, before I get to the layers, I just want to talk temperatures here. So these are our Churchill temperature averages. And I've highlighted the September, October, November uh, timelines there with our daily highs and daily average lows. Keep in mind, these are averages only. So for example, if we look in November, we have a daily average high of minus three Celsius, minus 11, an uh, average low of minus 11 Celsius. In Fahrenheit, that would go to a daily average high of 26 Fahrenheit and 13 Fahrenheit at night. However, these are only averages and we have seen November temperatures of in the negative 20s Fahrenheit. So there can be some significant variations from the average. And I'd certainly recommend that you take a look at the at the upcoming weather as you're packing for your trip. But with this and this, this amount of variation that you can see, we definitely recommend just packing a range of layering options. And these lists of gear that I'm gonna talk about right away are all found within your pre-departure briefing. So you may have this online or you may have it as a printed pre-departure briefing. It's got lots of information about your trip and it's got a great packing lists for things that we suggest that you will want to bring with you on your trip. One of our other guides laid out this wonderful clothing for me so we could have an example about what to, to talk through to bring here. So this would be an example of what we might wear, not including our outer layer of, for example, a windproof pants or jeans, something like that, as well as that parka. That we talked about. So this would be things that you'd want to bring in your own luggage. So we have here a warm hat. Um, it could be fleece or wool, whatever is most comfortable for you. A neck scarf, for example, that lovely Nathab um, gaiter that we have shown there in green. A fleece layer for underneath. This could be a lightweight fleece as well. And then a more substantial mid layer, something like a puffy jacket, and those are going to go underneath your big blue parka that we are going to loan you. You might choose to bring mittens, especially later in the season, or you might feel that gloves are adequate. This can depend on whether or not you're doing uh, or planning on doing much photography because it's nice to have the ability to stick your hands back in something warm after you've been taking photos uh, in the cold for a while. 
Um, we also would suggest some nice, comfortable socks. This might include a wool or polypropylene socks, as well as a, a long john layer. And that could be fleece or wool again as well, which should be worn underneath your, your outer pants. Um, and your outer pants can be, like I said, anything from jeans, uh, if you find that most comfortable, to khakis, to something a bit more substantial, like a soft shell. Again, depending what time of the season you're traveling with us. Now, these are great things to keep in mind for your layers. We spend a lot of time putting layers on and taking layers off, depending how warm we are and whether we're indoors or outdoors or going in between. On top of this, we will definitely suggest that you bring indoor shoes for greater comfort when you're having meals and walking around the hotel, some casual wear for meals as well, binoculars, camera slash smartphone, and I'll go over like specifically what kind of binoculars and camera you might want to think about. Um, and also keep in mind that Winnipeg is a pretty well-appointed city with a good outdoor store right downtown. So if you do arrive early and you look at the forecast and you say, oh no, I really should have packed an extra pair of socks or long johns or what have you. If you have a bit of time during store opening hours, it's certainly possible to do a little bit of last minute shopping in Winnipeg. Okay, so that's us getting our gear in Winnipeg. You've packed your bags. We are going to meet your guide for your welcome dinner go through so much information during that welcome dinner about what your specific trip is going to look like. And then your next step is to get a good sleep. And in the morning, we are going to proceed to our charter flight to Churchill. So our travel partner for our flights to Churchill is Calm Air. We always fly on planes that look more or less like this. It's a, if you care about planes, it's an ATR-72. It's a turboprop. It's about a two hour flight heading pretty well straight north around 650 miles or around a thousand kilometers. And um, during that flight, um, the seats go two by two. So you'll likely be sitting with you if you have a travel partner who you're traveling with or you'll make a new friend. And there's great views if there's anything to see besides clouds out the windows because you don't have a middle seat to, to lean over. Now, in terms of what you can bring with you on that flight, all those baggage allowances are also within that pre-departure briefing, but just to touch on it briefly, we do ask that every guest limits their luggage to a carry-on uh, bag slash a day pack, however you find is easiest to carry things around, as well as your checked baggage, which is ideally a soft-sided um, type of luggage. Um, hard luggage tends to get banged around a little bit more and it really limits the amount of space available in our cargo uh, space. So if possible, we do ask that you bring that soft-sided luggage. Um, and our, our flight restrictions is 50 pounds for your checked bag there. Now, if 50 pounds feels a little tight, remember you're, you are getting that jacket and that's not gonna count towards your allowance. If you have extra baggage that you'd like to leave behind in Winnipeg and be stored while you're in Churchill, that's very, very possible. We're happy to store it for you on that. Um, in Winnipeg. Now for anybody who may be traveling with big cameras or lenses um, of a size that wouldn't fit in a normal carry-on bag, we do have a system for keeping those cameras and lenses safe. They basically get tagged with some special tags, they go and sit in the back of the plane during the flights, and they're not accessible during the flight time, but then you get access to it once we land in Churchill. And this is how most of our guides transfer their cameras back and forth as well. So it's a pretty trustworthy system. Now, for anybody traveling to the Tundra Lodge, we do have one more suggestion. I'll go over the lodge in a second. Probably you already know if that's you, if you've booked on the lodge. Because our lodge rooms are singles, every single lodge room is a, is a single roomette. We recommend that instead of packing your bags together, for example, bringing one big bag for a traveling couple, our traveling partners, that you separate things into smaller bags because you're not going to be sharing a room with your traveling partner while you are at the lodge. And smaller bags are quite a bit easier and nicer to store in your roomettes at the lodge as well. So this is how we're getting up to Churchill when we arrive. Here's one of those photos that was not taken during bear season. Um, as of 2023, we have this beautiful new ramp to take us all the way up onto the plane. 
Uh, it's, it's a big improvement from those stairs and we're very, very happy with it. So you'll be driven right onto the tarmac in a bus uh, and you'll walk off the bus, hit the tarmac and then go straight onto the ramp up onto the plane. So very, very easy VIP service to get you onto your charter flights. And to give you an idea of roughly what it looks like on the inside, it's a pretty normal plane. Um, like I said, two by two seating, it's a turboprop aircraft, so a little bit noisier than a jets, but nothing, nothing incredibly noisy. Um, it's got a washroom on board. You can stash your parka and the overhead bin and your knapsack or your day pack at your feet. There is an in-flight service available. And um, because we are traveling as efficiently as possible and to keep our carbon emissions as low as possible, we will be combining groups who are traveling on the flights. Um, this is for the flight only. We don't spend a lot of time with other NATHAB groups, but for the flights, we put multiple departures onto the same aircraft. So it's not just going to be your 16 people who are traveling on a flight. There's going to be more than that on the flight. But once you hit the ground in Churchill, we separate out into our individual groups and we are going to be loading up on a bus with our Churchill travel partner called Great White Bear Tours. We spend a lot of time either on the Great White Bear Tours, uh, tour buses or the, the rovers, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so whether you're around town, all activities, we're going to be moving around on a bus. Um, it's a usually a 24 person bus and we have 16 person groups. So lots of extra space for gear and cameras, things like that. Um, often feedback that we get is that people say that we are taking buses for distances that are, that are quite walkable. And that's certainly true, but we ask that you keep the fact that we are visiting Churchill during the height of polar bear occurrences and polar bears showing up in town uh, time of year. And bears do often make their way through Churchill, just like we will. So because of the potential bear occurrences right in town, as well as sometimes having slippery walking conditions, most of the time that we're out and moving as a group, we are going to be doing it by bus. And certainly all the time after dark, we'll be moving around by bus as well. But regardless, it's going to be a single group on a bus. You'll be well spaced out. We work well below capacity. Um, which is really one of our, our best benefits to traveling with NATHAB here. So you can see lots of space. We get our private bus and driver for our group. Um, so let's talk about what we'll do next and where you're going to be staying. So I just wanted to take a moment here to address the different itineraries that we offer. So this webinar here is really designed to talk about polar bear season in general and your polar bear trip. But if you've been through our website or you've spoken with our adventure specialists, you've probably been made aware of the fact that we offer different itineraries that are all polar bear programs. So some of our trips you might see labeled as like our premier polar bear trip, or if you saw it a while ago, it might have been labeled a classic polar bear trip. These are trips that are based in Churchill and you'll stay at one of the local hotels and drive out about half an hour one way every uh, or almost almost every day in most cases to do a, a polar bear tour in a wildlife management area. Um, this is not the only type of tour we offer. However, we also have Tundra Lodge trips and I'll show you what the lodge looks like in a moment. But for those staying on the lodge, you will spend comparatively very little time in town because you're not eating there and you're not sleeping there. Uh, and then we also have an itinerary called Town and Tundra that splits that time. So you'll have two nights in town and two nights on our Tundra Lodge. Um, so just to kind of give you any, an idea what the different itineraries are really basically. Now in town, if you're staying and uh, doing one of our premier polar bear tours based in town, we have several partner hotels that we work with in town. They're all a little bit different. They're all approximately the same. Uh, this is a great example of a typical room coming up. So it's warm, it's comfortable, it's clean. Um, it's, you know, it doesn't have the amenities of the Fort Gary Hotel, but it's in Churchill and you're gonna see polar bears. Uh, so this is the place to be if you wanna be doing that. Now, for those of you who are staying on the lodge doing one of the tundra lodge trips or the town and tundra trips this is what the lodge looks like and it's located um it's about 
be about 15 miles outside the town of Churchill within a special area that I'll talk about in a second called the Wildlife Management Area. It's where all of our trips go for their bear viewing activities. But if you're staying on the lodge, you stay on the lodge and you stay in the Wildlife Management Area as well. So if you look at the lodge here, it's kind of set up like a train approximately, but it stays in one place in a really good viewing location. The, the left-hand car there is the dining car. Next to the right is the lounge car. And then the final two cars there are the sleeping cars where the washrooms and the roomettes are located. Now, one thing I do want to point out with our Tundra Lodge especially is that when we're in the wildlife management area, you'll notice as we kind of go through photos, you'll see polar bear tracks, you'll see vehicle tracks. You're not going to see any human footprints because at no time uh, during polar bear season do we hit the ground with our feet except to load on the vehicles themselves. So when you arrive at the Tundra Lodge, your vehicle will back right up. You'll load directly from your vehicle onto the lodge and you're on the Tundra, you're in that wonderful space, but you're not going to be doing any walking tours or anything like that from the lodge itself. It is a really neat place. You are quite immersed in the tundra at that point. So you're located right on the coast in an area that polar bears often frequent. Um, and sometimes we're lucky enough to have a bear or other wildlife come very close to the lodge. Now the, the, the rooms on the lodge are not as spacious as the rooms in town. So they are what we call roomettes. They're analogous to rooms on a train, for example. So everyone is a single and you either have an upper berth or a lower berth. This here is an example of an, an upper berth roomette. Now it's perfectly adequate in size for all the luggage that you're going to bring with you. Every room has a window, so you're able to look out at any time of day. Um, we don't spend a lot of time in our rooms because we're out and exploring and doing things or enjoying the, the lodge amenities, but all the rooms do have a plug-in in case you want to charge up your phone or in case you need to plug in your CPAP at night, for example. And then there are shared bathrooms towards the center of the lodge. On the lodge, you have private dining experiences with only those who are on the lodge um, eating there. And it's catered by the talented chefs that we have on our lodge. However, if you're not on a lodge trip, have no fear. You will also have great meals. They will simply be based out of Churchill. Now, Churchill is very remote um, and with that sometimes we do have challenges moving fresh food up to Churchill but the food is is decent it is plentiful you will never go hungry and our meal locations will vary depending uh, you know which which hotel you're staying at which restaurant you're eating at that night or some of our meals are actually taken out on our activities themselves now one thing I really do want to emphasize is that we are really good at accommodating all common dietary requirements, but it is critical that we know those dietary requirements well in advance. Our chefs work weeks and weeks ahead to make sure that we have all the food required, especially for those special dietary needs in Churchill, because I do assure you that special food cannot be purchased in Churchill. We have to make sure that we get it there um, ahead, of, well ahead of time. So if you have any special dietary needs, you will absolutely be taken care of. Um, make sure that you get that, us that information in advance, and then also make sure at your welcome dinner that you're having a conversation with your guide about exactly what you need and what those dietary requirements are, the severity of your allergies uh, that you may have, and so on like that. So. With all that, I do want to say they're great meals. I've eaten a lot of Churchill meals and I certainly have not wasted away, I'll tell you that much. Um, and it is important to, you know, to be properly and safely fed. So we will make sure that we take care of that for you. So we've heard about how you're going to get there. We've heard about what kind of gear you need. We've talked about accommodations. We've talked about meals. Um, but now let's talk about what I think is the most exciting thing, because you're not on a food trip, you're on a bear trip. Uh, the activities and what we're going to be doing in, in and around Churchill. So <laughs> we laugh sometimes because it's hard to believe, but Churchill has so many things to do. We're going to try to do everything while we're there, but I guarantee that there's just going to be some things that we don't have time for. The highlight activity, of course, is going to be the wildlife viewing opportunities from the Polar Rover. 
So remember I mentioned that we're with Great White Bear Tours quite a bit, so we're with them on our buses and their drivers there. But we are also going to spend quite a bit of time on this type of vehicle here. This is called a Polar Rover. And when we head out in this, we are heading out in the wildlife management area to do wildlife viewing. Now, um, our goal anytime that we are out, whether we're on this vehicle or we're on foot or we're in a bus, is that we are providing whatever wildlife we encounter the opportunity to make whatever decision they want to make about whether or not they will approach or interact or walk away or go back to sleep. Our goal is really to let the bear be the bear, let the animal be the animal, and let them make all the decisions. If they choose to approach our vehicle, which they do often do, that's awesome. And if not, we enjoy watching them in their natural habitat. When we head out on these machines, depending which itinerary you're on, you'll be out usually for either four or eight hours at a time, depending on, like I said, your itinerary and your exact schedule. Um, for those who are staying on the lodge, it's almost always four hour blocks at a time because you travel in a larger group and we split the group in half to let half the group enjoy the lodge amenities, half the group go out at a, on one of these vehicles at a time. And this is because you've already gone a lot of the way into the wildlife management area, so you're kind of starting from the middle, as it were. Um, things to know about the vehicles. First question is always, do they have a bathroom? Yes, they have a bathroom. Um, they'll go over any any intricacies on how to use it, though it's pretty straightforward. Most importantly, you don't want the vehicle to be moving while you're in that room. You'll also see that there is a back viewing deck available, and this image is at the far right-hand side there. And sometimes we get questions about, well, if I get motion sick, will I get motion sick on this vehicle? It's certainly a possibility that the suspension is really good, but the roads themselves that we travel on are old military roads with lots of rocks and up and down. So if that sounds like something that might bother you, um, you can certainly chat with your guide at the welcome dinner, but make sure that you're bringing along any regular medication that you might take for motion sickness. I've mentioned the words wildlife management area a few times, and you might be wondering like, what? What is that? What is she talking about? Well, the Churchill Wildlife Management Area is this really special place that we are going to be spending a lot of our time in. It is an area that's really been set aside as a protected area surrounding a national park where bears are free to be bears. There's lots of bear denning sites within that area. And most importantly for us, it's really limited access and limited permitted vehicles in that area. So because there are so there's so little commercial activity, it's really just limited to a small handful of local operators who run vehicles around. Uh, we get great access to that bear's preferred area during our trips. Now, it's not to say that you might not see a bear again in town or on the way to the rover, but this is really the prime bear viewing areas that we are going to be going to. This is an example of a route that was taken one day on a trip and you might say, okay, that's great. How far are we talking about? Well, really not that far. We might be doing a daily loop of around, I would say between five and 10 miles. So it's not fast moving. And even though there are no trees in the area because there's a lot of rocks and a little bit of topography, we do travel quite a ways to kind of get a different view on all of these locations. Now, I mentioned before that we're using old military roads. These are pretty rough roads, um, though as the season progresses and the snow packs up, it does smooth out quite a bit. And in some areas, we'll be going through shallow water or over, over ice later in the season too. Um, so it's a very rustic, um, rugged area for sure. And why the bears are in this area specifically, your guide's certainly gonna go over that, but the short story is that they are waiting along the shores of Hudson Bay for that annual sea ice to form so that they can go out on the ice and hunt seals um, and feed themselves. So this is right now during the typical bear fasting time until that ice forms back up. So we drive, like I said, quite slowly as we move along these roads and everybody keeps their eyes peeled for wildlife. In terms of what it looks like on the inside, this is it. Uh, window seats for everybody. So our trips have usually 15, 16 people on them or thereabouts. 
These vehicles are much larger than that. So everybody gets a window seat as well as an extra seat besides them. Uh, all those windows open for viewing or photography. And what I'll just mention is that your guide will talk about at the welcome dinner, rotation of seats as you're out during the day. And we do ask that we rotate uh, seats around the vehicle so that if you've been in the front one day, you move back on the next day, unless it's a it's an issue around motion sickness, for example. And also if, for example, there's an occasion where wildlife is more visible from one part of the vehicle, if you've been there and you've had a great view and a great experience, rotate back and let the people behind you move forward. So your guide's gonna be talking about that and um, making sure that everybody gets a good chance for a good view. Now, how you might view? Well, you might view off the back deck. Um, you might step outside. One of the many reasons that we dress in layers when we're out on the tundra. So you may, may notice in this image here that there's some bears on the road behind us and this guest is using her iPhone for photography. And we have found that with the newer generation cell phones, people are very happy with a lot of the images and videos that they get. So there's a lot of good ways to view that way. So the back deck, you just walk out the back and again, as long as the vehicle stopped, you're free to head out back there. What it looks like is kind of like that if you're looking around. If you're incredibly lucky um, and a bear or other wildlife happens to walk directly underneath you, the back deck has a graded floor, so you will be able to see anything that might be underneath you. Uh, so when your guide talks about making sure that you don't have any dangling scarves or anything else like that, this is the kind of thing that we're thinking about when we say those things. Um, so it really is like an Arctic safari. We're moving around the tundra. We're looking for wildlife. We're talking about what we're doing. And it's everybody's job to do that spotting. Now, sometimes as we're moving around, we might not be actively looking at wildlife at all times, but your guide is going to be there the whole way through and you're going to talk about bear biology and learn about bear conservation, learn more about the history of the Churchill area. We might take breaks in viewing to do some interpretation and talk about, you know, more details about what we're seeing. Um, and on those days that we're out, whether it's for four or eight hours, have no fear, you will also receive food and beverages while we're out. So that food that's on the rovers is pre uh, prepared by our NatHab chefs, uh, who can again handle all those reasonable dietary requirements. I'll remind you that we need those well in advance because when we're out on the tundra watching a bear having a sandwich, we want to make sure that that sandwich is one that you can eat because um, it can't, can't arrive to you otherwise. Now, this next image coming up is, I think, one of my favorites, uh, really, of all time because it shows us some of the ways that we can view bears. So this is always such a highlight picture to get in those events where bears may approach a rover Sometimes they will actually come back on their hind legs and put their forelegs up on the rover and check it out, investigate us and what we're doing. But what I love about this picture is that if you look at the people, there's a couple of people looking at that bear at the front and everybody else is pointed in a different direction. And then you notice that the bear is pointed in that direction too. So there's sometimes more than one thing happening at a time as well. And as you can see from this image, while it's really cool to get a bear up like that, often the best viewing is actually happening happening elsewhere because when they're so close like that they can be quite difficult to see so it's our job really to keep our eye out in all directions so you can see here from looking out the front windows to putting those side windows down to going out on the back deck we have the ability to look around in all directions from these these vehicles and it really is everybody's job to spot bears um, your guide has two eyes and we all have eyes and we should be all looking for animals all the time um, so that's our job and we spend a lot of time doing that and with that I want to talk a little bit about bringing binoculars now if you have already you know signed up for this trip you know it's a it's a really big investment in time and you're coming all the way up here and you want to see some wildlife you want to bring a good pair of binoculars with you. And when I say good, I'm going to I'm going to talk about some numbers. And those numbers, there's always two sets of numbers with binoculars. The first set is how much magnification you get. And sometimes you think to yourself, well, I want all the magnification. I want it to be as strong as possible. 
but the second number with binoculars is how wide your field of view is. And we suggest a sweet spot of around eight by 42, or perhaps 10 by 42 or 10 by 50. So something in that, um, a field of view that's around the 40 or 50 millimeter level, because that's going to give you a much bigger picture as you're looking around. So when we're talking about those tiny little, um, very compact, very light binoculars that are still convenient to travel with, um, they're great backup binoculars, but it would certainly not be my first thing that I would recommend to bring with you. Um, and if you're traveling with a partner or other, uh, other family members or traveling partners, I would also really recommend making sure that you have a pair of binoculars for each person uh, who's traveling. Um, if you need to save on weight, save your weight somewhere else. Do not skimp on your binoculars. Now these ones uh, in this image here are obviously toy binoculars. <laughs> they don't need to be that big, but you'll want something relatively substantial. Okay, so that's binoculars. Let's talk cameras, uh, because even if you're traveling with a, a large camera with a good lens, you're still going to want binoculars. It's just such, it just opens up what you can see while you are out there. Now, I did mention before that many people are quite happy with the cell phones and the cameras that are on the cell phones. This image here, for example, was taken from quite a distance, though, with a big camera with a big lens. And if you are somebody who is um, traveling on our photography trips, or if you're somebody, somebody who's simply into photography and is interested in bringing gear, we have a great list of recommendations within that pre-departure briefing. And you can get more specific recommendations if you like by contacting your adventure specialists or asking any specific questions. But that pre-departure briefing does contain a lot of information on our recommended lenses. Really something that gives you a really good variety of, of focal lengths is, um, is going to be something really, really helpful to you. And for those traveling with longer lenses, we do have um, a number of bean bags that you can use to help steady those lenses if you're putting them, for example, on the window while you shoot. But all that being said, I can't stress enough how many people are absolutely ecstatic with the images that they get just from their cell phone. And if you are considering buying a brand new camera for this trip and you're worried that you're not gonna great, get great images without a new camera, I really would encourage you like not to stress about it. Don't worry, don't panic. Um, your guide's also gonna be taking photos. Most of the people in your trip are gonna be taking photos. And we do have a photo share that we set up after the fact. So people can upload their best photos for sharing as well. And you will likely be quite happy with the, with the images that you get. If you wish to bring a camera, including a new camera, by all means do so, but um, your cell phone is going to be a great tool for you. And, you know, when all else fails and you don't want to use your binoculars and you don't want to use your phone and you don't want to use your camera, you could always use those old fashioned eyes that you have too. And honestly, that can be the best experience. A lot of the time, what our recommendations are is, you know, get a photo that you're happy with, put your camera down and just enjoy because you are going to see those behaviors. You're gonna see how those bears interact with each other and with the landscape. And it's gonna be such a great way of connecting yourself with that nature that you're traveling through. So I've talked a lot about bears and how to do photography and so on of bears. Bears are certainly the highlight, but not everything that we see while we're on trip. There are other animals that we keep our eyes open for as well. Just to give you some examples here, Arctic hare is a really neat little highlights. Um, they're especially fun when the seasons are changing and there's no snow on the ground yet, but the, the hairs are already white. So that's about the only time of year when they're easy to spot. Otherwise they blend in very, very well. Arctic fox, really cool. Um, always lots to talk about with foxes, especially Arctic foxes. They're quite fascinating and really neat to watch. Um, there are some birds, there aren't many birds up there at this time of year, but you may see a deer falcon. Uh, you may also perhaps spot a snowy owl. They're always quite exciting to see and they can be quite cryptic as well and difficult. You can see how well that animal blends in with its surroundings. So 
always good to have all eyes on the landscape looking for things. You may also see red foxes and you might say, Eleanor, that doesn't look like a red fox, that looks like a black or a silver fox. Um, the species here is the red fox and they come in different colors, so they can be pretty neat to see in, in their different color forms. Um, one of the other birds that you might see is the willow ptarmigan. They're quite small, kind of small chicken sized birds, very funny little guys and also quite cryptic again, so difficult spots. Um, when they're in the snow and in the correct coloring, always fun, fun to see. And I think a, a favorite of many people is the common raven. Even if you have ravens where you are, they are, they're big birds up in Churchill and they're, they're quite beautiful and they really stand out against the snow and the landscape. So while, again, wildlife is always going to be our focus, we're doing lots of wildlife centered activities. It's not the only thing Churchill has to offer. We're not done yet. <laughs> Uh, like I said, you can't possibly see everything there is to see in Churchill, but we sure do try. Um, for example, the Sanitac Museum, maybe somewhere that you visit, it's an Inuit art and culture museum. Uh, you may visit the, not the inside, but the outside of the polar bear holding facility and talk about how the polar bear alert program is helping to conserve bears and keep people and bears safe in the Churchill area. Um, you might do a mural tour and check out some of the beautiful murals around town, um, including this one, which is one of my personal favorites. You might go visit Parks Canada and get some interpretation from our, our national park staff. Uh, and you will likely meet with our some local presenters as well. So these are people who are from Churchill who are willing and lovely and, and share some of their stories with us when we're when we're around town and they're all just fantastic individuals. So lots to do. Um, one optional activity that you can sign up for is a 60 minute helicopter, scenic helicopter tour. Um, this is something that you can sign up for in advance by the website or by calling your adventure specialist. Um, our ultimate Churchill trips do include the helicopter, but if for anybody else who would like to add on a helicopter trip, uh, that is available and we just facilitate that with our our travel partners there. Um, for some of us, our favorite wildlife might not be the foxes or the bears or the ravens. It might be the canine residents of Churchill that you run into because all of our tours do include a, uh, a dog mushing interpretation and experience. So this is a really fantastic time. Um, if it's earlier in the season and there is not yet the amount of snow required for a, an actual sled, our musher uses a wheeled vehicle that he designed specifically for this kind of experience. I assure you that the dogs do not care whether they're pulling a wheeled vehicle or a sled and you will have a great time regardless as well. And he'll switch over to the snow sleds when there's enough snowpack uh, for that trip. It's just, um, it's an experience, it's an interpretation of dog mushing and, and why people do it and how it's done. And you get a little snapshot of, of what it might be like to be a dog musher. So all of this has been a whirlwind look at your upcoming trip. I hope this has helped to answer most of your questions, but I also wanted to make sure we had a decent amount of time for our Q&A. So I'm gonna hand this back to Rob to facilitate our question and answer period. And while that happens, I'm just gonna scroll through some highlight images as we chat. All right, thank you so much. Now before we start with the question and answer session i would like to remind everyone that you can submit your questions via the question field in your control panel uh, if a question doesn't get answered or something else comes up after the webinar those of you who are booked can refer to your pre-departure materials or you can call the office and speak directly to somebody okay let's get to some questions so if I'm on a trip and I'm staying with you, say, at the Tundra Lodge, are, are towels provided for us? Yes, absolutely. So things like towels, um, all you would expect in a hotel, for example, towels, washcloths, um, toiletries, um, assorted little sundries that you might have forgotten. We have all of that available at the lodge, and that's exactly as you would expect for your use and that does include hair dryers as well so there is no need to travel with a hair dryer whether you're going to a town-based trip or at the lodge great thank you now we know that nadhab will provide us some boots uh 
Is there any other footwear that you recommend us bringing? Is sneakers something we should bring? Yeah, that's right. So we are going to provide you with boots, and those are great boots. They're made in Canada. They're built for Canadian winters. They've got great tread on the bottom. Um, if you haven't spent any time with winter boots, they're not like hiking boots. They don't fit your foot like a like a glove. They're meant to kind of sit on your foot and make a warm pocket of air around them. And um, you kind of slouch around town like all the locals will in your boots. Um, those will be what you wear pretty well anytime that you're going on the rover or when you are stepping outside to go gift shop exploring or anything like that. So that's going to be what you wear the majority of the time. However, for quick trips around town, for example, you're leaving your hotel and going to a presentation or leaving your hotel and going to dinner, a lot of people find it um, really nice to have an extra pair of footwear that's like a comfortable um, sneaker or even a slipper type shoe just to make it a little bit nicer for, for your feet during the during the day because our winter boots all winter boots have some weight to them and bringing a pair of sneakers will help relieve that a um, couple of things about that if you're on the lodge because you are within the lodge a lot of the time you spend less time wearing winter boots we'll still send you with them because you'll still need them for dog sledding and what have you but when you're on the lodge it's warm and comfortable and you'll wear your slippers or sneakers a lot of the time and for anybody traveling with orthotics and who needs a, some more supportive footwear, you can always pop your orthotics right into the, the boots that you're borrowing from us and uh, just make sure to grab them when your trip is all done so we're not left with your orthotics in Winnipeg. Great, thank you. Now, when we're traveling, uh, are these boots something that we're going to have to account for in our luggage or does Nat have to take care of that? Uh, those boots are going to be on your feet as we head up to Churchill. And one of the reasons for that is that when we get to Churchill, the plane lands, the door opens, the ramp comes up. And after you step off the ramp, you have to walk across the tarmac a little bit to get to um, in, inside the terminal and then from the terminal to your bus. And as winter progresses, but especially, honestly, in the beginning part of winter, it can be quite slick in areas and we'll have a hand there for you. Um, the Transport Canada will make sure that there's, you know, sand or gravel to make it less slippery. But honestly, a good pair of boots is really important and one of the most important things you can do to help prevent slips and falls while you're moving on a slippery surface. So your parka and your boots, you are going to wear your boots and carry your parka with you or wear it, uh, depending how cold it is, onto the plane as you head up to Churchill. So it's not going to count against your weight. Great, great, thank you for covering that. So let's talk about tipping and money for a second. Do <clears throat> Do I need Canadian dollars? Uh, is there a place to exchange money or can I use American dollars? That's a great question. Yeah, if you're traveling from the States and you have US cash, uh, what you'll find in Churchill is that US cash is readily accepted. So if you want to you know, buy a pair of moccasins from a local, um, for example, people will accept US cash, but you're not going to get it at an exchange rate that's favorable to you. Right now, the US dollar is worth quite a bit more than the Canadian dollar. So if you're paying Canadian prices in US dollars, um, it's not going to be to your advantage. So if you'd like to carry some Canadian cash, you certainly can. It's not required. Uh, most places will accept Visa or MasterCard. American Express and Discover, much less so, but Visa and MasterCard, very, very widely accepted except for if you wanted to leave, for example, an extra gratuity with your bus driver or with a, um, an interpreter, um, or if you wanted to buy something directly from a local producer, like a pair of moccasins is the easiest example there, that would be a time that you would have to have cash for that kind of thing. Otherwise, your credit cards will get you through um, pretty well any kind of retail therapy that you want to engage in in Churchill. So if we arrive a little bit early and uh, say we're going to spend the day in Winnipeg, how, how early is it that we can pick up those parkas? Yeah, so 
our Boots and Park a room will open in early October and uh, will be open every day uh, in the afternoon all the way through to the end of the season. So that's all to say that really whenever you arrive, we will have opening hours for Boots and Parkas that day. Um, and if, for example, you arrive early in the morning and you need a parka right away because it's really cold out, we can make sure that we get that to you as well. But we do have regular opening hours for that Boots and Parka room every single day, and you are welcome to pick up gear as soon as you need it. Great. Thank you so much for addressing that. Um, so do you recommend tripods for the trip? Ah, good question about the tripods. In short, my recommendation would be that you do not require tripods for the trip. Some people have found monopods to be really helpful, but because we're very nearly all or most of your wildlife viewing is going to be done from one of these polar rover machines. Um, there is a limited amount of floor space in which to set up a tripod without your camera getting tripped over by somebody. However, monopods are great because they can keep it out of the way. Um, another thing that can be really helpful is I mentioned bean bags before. We use bean bags to help reduce the vibration coming from the vehicle while you're taking your, your photo. And if you have one of those really big lenses that you don't want to hold the weight on, you can then rest that lens on the window ledge or on the back ledge of, um, of the back deck and still have a nice steady image without having to drag along a tripod with you. Great, thank you so much. Let me ask you this question. If I wanted to clean some clothing, will laundry be available to me? So if you wanted to clean clothing, uh, I, you know, we do not have a lot of time on these trips. We are very, very busy. So I would hardly recommend bringing as much clean clothing as you think that you will need for the duration of your trip. Some of our facilities in Churchill, the, um, the hotels that we stay in in Churchill do have some limited, very limited laundry hours available. So that could be an option should an emergency happen, but it wouldn't be something that I would recommend that you count on for your laundry purposes. Um, if, if possible, please try to bring the amount of clothing that you will require for your trip. Great, thank you. So are there organized activities to go into town or is that something I should plan on doing on my own? Yeah, so depending which itinerary that you are on, I'll start with, for example, the, uh, the Tundra Lodge itinerary where you're not in town at all, right? You're sleeping out on in the wildlife management area on the Tundra Lodge. You do get some time in town on that itinerary. It's just the last day, kind of before you fly back to Winnipeg. And that's done on a much more scheduled basis because you have very limited time in town. So they'll make sure they bring you in, that you see a few things before heading to the airport. For those who are staying in town, you will have some time to yourself every day. It's usually not a lot of time, but we wanna make sure that you have a, an adequate amount of time to you know, get the gear that you need, to make sure that you have time to put your feet up for a few minutes if need be, or to stretch your legs or to go check out some gift shops. Your guide will do their best to make sure that you have opportunities for visiting the museum, for going to gift shops, for getting to presenters, but if you want to do things above and beyond that while you're in town during your free time, your guide's gonna talk to you about safety when you move around within Churchill, because you'll certainly see when you get there, there are people out and walking around and doing their grocery shopping and you know, stopping in at the museum and going gift shopping. Um, but we really do try to limit that as much as possible to daylight hours. So your guide will have that conversation around safety uh, for when you want to go out and explore town on your own. And you can do that, like I said, in addition to the time that your guide's already going to be providing for activities in town. Are walking sticks a good idea for us to bring? So again, we're not going to be doing a lot of miles. So we don't need walking sticks like you're going to be climbing up a, you know, a 3,000 foot hill. 
Um, however, a lot of people do find that walking sticks can be helpful um, over, over icy areas. So if you are somebody who feels like walking sticks would be useful to you in your normal day-to-day -day life. For example, if you consider walking sticks for walking to the grocery store, or if you consider walking sticks for um, a short you know, walk around the block, I would advise bringing walking sticks with you to Churchill. If that doesn't sound like you, and if you don't normally use walking sticks for that level of activity, um, they really wouldn't be necessary for the amount of walking that we'll be doing around Churchill. So how long is the dog sled portion of the trip? Is that, is that a long time? Oh, I mean, it's a perfect length. Um, the, the experience itself, the, the dog sledding, how long you were on the actual dog sled, um, it's, a, it's approximately a mile loop that they take you on. We call it a taste of dog sledding, just enough to either get you really excited and make you want to do more, or for 99% of people say, okay, that was pretty chilly. Um, that was fun. I probably don't want to do 50 miles on the back of a dog sled. Uh, so it's a it's a fairly short time. It's usually five to 10 minutes, depending on how fast the dogs are running and how much snow was on the ground that day. But we do have it as part of a larger experience where we're learning about the culture of dog sledding and how to dog sled and so much more. It's not just the dog sledding, it's a whole wonderful dog kennel visit that we're doing. Great, well, thanks for addressing that. Unfortunately, that is going to be the last question that we do have time for today. So I'd like to remind everyone that if you're, you do have a question that didn't get answered, you can send us an email or get in touch with us directly. And I'm gonna throw it back to you, Eleanor, for your closing comments. Ah, uh, thanks so much, Rob. I'm, as I said, I'm just so excited to be coming up to bear season. The, uh, the leaves are turning on the trees and the air is changing and it must be, it's almost bear season. I hope this has been helpful to everybody and I look forward to seeing you all in Winnipeg this fall. Eleanor, thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today. And I'd also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. If you're interested in information on how you can travel with NatHab, please give us a call at the number on your screen, or you can send us an email at info at nathab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude today's webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next time.